Thank you to the um, organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, nice to be giving this talk. So yes, I'm going to be speaking about actually some joint work with uh, my student at UIC, well, Atkinson. Uh, let me start with some uh, motivation. Okay. So the motivation behind the results uh, I'm going to be talking about is to a search to analyze analogs of stationarity, but for singular cardinals. You know, so the usual notion of stationary sets is defined for a regular kappa. Well, how do we get an analog of that, but for singular cardinal? This is uh, one question. And then once we have such an analog, how does this analog interact with singular arithmetic? Uh, because we'll see in a little bit that Somehow, unlike regular cardinals, at singular cardinals, the cardinal arithmetic becomes a lot more somehow intricate. Okay. And the two, as uh, suggested by the title, central notions I'm going to be talking about is mutual stationarity, which is the, that analog of stationarity for singular cardinals, and the central notion um, to do with singular cardinal arithmetic is, you know, the singular cardinal hypothesis, which just to recall, states that if kappa is singular strong limit, then two to the kappa is kappa plus. So in particular, one can think of SCH as a parallel of the continuum hypothesis, but for singular cardinal. So it says that the power set of a singular cardinal is the smallest possible value it could have. And the more broad question behind studying these interactions is, what constraints does cardinal arithmetic impose on combinatorial properties at singular cardinals specifically? Yeah. So now let me uh, talk about stationarity and what do I mean when I say an analog of stationarity for singular cardinals? So let's first go to stationarity for a regular cardinal. So let kappa be a regular cardinal and let uh, kappa less than lambda. Here lambda can be singular. Now, so first I want to start with somehow an alternative characterization of a stationary set. So we know that a subset S is stationary uh, in kappa if it meets every club in kappa. But there is another equivalence. So S is stationary in kappa if for every algebra on lambda, one can find an elementary substructure N such that sub N intersection kappa is uh, in S. Uh, is an element in S. And this is kind of a standard characterization of stationary sets. In this way, one can think of every algeb algebra as representing clubs and elementary substructures, and in this case, as representing elements. So mm -hmm. this is um, a characterization of stationarity for, you know, good old vanilla stationarity for regular cardinals, a well known uh, characterization now. And Having this definition, we get the following analog for singular cardinals. Okay, so suppose we have a singular cardinal kappa, and let's take a sequence of increasing regular cardinals, kappa n, with limit kappa. So we want to talk about, so we cannot talk about a stationary subset of kappa. However, let's take a stationary sequence of sets Sn, where each Sn is a subset of kappa n. And now, we have the following definition. This sequence is called mutually stationary. If, well, very similar definition as the one above. For every algebra A on kappa, there is an elementary substructure N such that for all N, sub N intersection, this guy, sub N intersection kappa N is an element in SN. And now that, hence the word mutually, because this, uh, so we're looking for a substructure N, which simultaneously witnesses the stationarity of the SNs. So I made this definition by assuming that each SN is already stationary uh, because it has to be. So in order for a sequence to be mutually stationary, every SN has to be stationary. And let me make a further definition. Now, given a sequence uh, Tn n less than omega, for example, each Tn can be kappa in itself, we say that mutual stationarity holds <clears throat> at the TNs if every sequence SN, which SN sub the TN, is mutually stationary. 
So the history of this number. Don't you need that? Don't you need that the SN are uh, stationary because otherwise. Yeah. So actually, in order for I, I just mentioned, in order for the yes, you do. But by definition, if you're mutually stationary, you have to be stationary. But. But suppose yes, that, yes, right. that, that, yes. uh, that you take a sequence of non-stationary sets. Yes, oh no, I, I should have put stationary here. Otherwise it does. So if every stationary sequence Sn is mutually stationary. Uh, so I, as I was telling Raphael, I usually give board talks. So <laughs> I haven't written slides like for this is the first slide talk I've written in maybe six months. Okay. So yeah, mutual stationarity holds at the end if every stationary sequence is uh, mutually stationary. So some history, I mean, this is actually an old notion. Um, it was originally introduced by uh, Martin Menahem, uh, so Foreman Magidor in 2001 in their paper, the non-saturation of the non-stationary ideal. And that's what they used it to prove. Uh, among other things, they showed in that paper that if you restrict to stationary sets of countable points of countable cofinality, mutual stationarity always holds. So they proved that for any, so here kappa ends are increasing sequence of regular cardinals. We have that every stationary sequence of the kappa ends restricted to cof omega is mutually stationary. Um, now, what about higher? Finalities. Well, it turns out, and again, this is due to uh, Matt and Menachem from the same paper, this result does not generalize to fixed, higher fixed cofinality. So in particular, they show that in L, uh, there is a sequence of stationary subsets Sn in alpha N intersection cof omega 1, which is not mutually stationary. Yeah. So since then, I mean, somehow like an old question, uh, was posed, well, can one get um, consistency of mutual stationarity at the elephants, let's say, of higher cofinality? Um, so at the elephants or in general, the capens, uh, for some capens. And it turns out that when you restrict yourself to higher cofinality, uh, large cardinals come into play. So my next slide is, again, some... Uh, his uh, survey of uh, highlighted results. So in, uh, again, Cummings, Foreman, Magidor, a few years later showed that, well, what is one easy way to get uh, mutual stationarity? Suppose you force uh, with a free forcing to singularize a measurable cardinal kappa and let kappa and n less than omega be the pre sequence. Well, then, so in the generic extension, mutual stationarity holds at this pre sequence for, for all copy analysis. So here there is no restriction. Okay. Um, now, what about bringing it down to the elephants? So uh, around the same time, Kopke showed that, you know, you can massage this pre forcing. So from measurable cardinal, one can get a model where at every other elephant, so Aleph 2 n plus 1, restricted to cop omega 1, uh, mutual stationarity holds. And then um, by Kopke Walsh, uh, was shown that the measurable cardinal is necessary. But still, for a while it remains open. What about if you want to uh, get mutual stationarity at every elephant? Okay. And then um, uh, several years ago, uh, Omer showed, so Benaria showed that from Omega super compact one can indeed force mutual stationarity at the elephants for any fixed cofinality. So for any k, if you start, so if you start with omega minus super compact, there is a forcing extension sorted for every k alpha n intersection cof omega k. Um, is every sequence in uh, those cardinals is mutual mutually stationary. Yep. Any questions? Too fast. Yeah, maybe I have a question. So, <laughs> all in, in, in all these examples, the SNs are one inside the other. Is it part of the definition, or uh, it's possible to think of a mutual stationarity with the SN 
different, like what, not the one nested into the other? Well, they don't need to be a subsets of each other, if that's what you're asking, because they're stationary subsets of increasing cardinals. Okay, but they can be not one inside the other. You can assume that they're disjoint, actually. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, you can even assume that you, for every n, you're looking at stationary subsets of alpha n set minus alpha. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, and um, now let me say a couple of words about uh, Omer's model. So what he does, the forcing construction is actually uh, quite natural. So he takes omega mega super compact cardinals and uses Levy collapses to turn them into the elephants. So now what is the cardinal structure uh, in his model? Well, just by virtue of using Levy collapses to make a sequence of super compact cardinals become the elephants, you get that SCH at alpha omega holds. And actually even more in his model, GCH is true. Also, another uh, feature of his model is that approachability at alpha omega holds too. And therefore, uh, for people who are, uh, know about these facts, uh, approachability implies that the tree property at alpha omega plus one fails. So then this raised uh, the following questions. Well, can we, is that necessary? Namely, can we get mutual stationarity at the elephants for a fixed? Uncountable cofinality together with the failure of SCH. Or what about uh, together with the tree property at alpha omega plus one? Yeah. And uh, it, so I'll we'll show that the answer to both of these questions is yes. So the next slide is the, states the, the two main theorems. And as I said, they're both uh, joined with my student, Will Atkinson uh, from UIC. Uh, who is, by the way, graduating next year and will be on the market in the fall. Uh, so the first theorem says, suppose that you have uh, three super compact cardinals, kappa less and mu less and lambda, um, and pick some m less than omega. Then there is a generic extension where mutual stationarity holds at the elephants restricted to cough omega m, and SCH fails at alpha omega. So this is the first theorem. And uh, the second theorem is now suppose that there are omega many super compact cardinals and let's again pick some M. Uh, there is a generic extension where mutual stationarity holds at again, alpha N intersection cough uh, alpha M and the tree property holds at alpha omega plus one. And reading this, let me make a remark. So um, the generic extension does not depend on your fixed M. So I should have said <clears throat> there is a generic extension such that for every M, you can get mutual stationarity for that fixed cofinality. And this is true in both theorems. So the, the extension does not depend on the M. So this is a note uh, to, to change the order of these guys. And another uh, remark I want to make about the first theorem. So I stated it as <clears throat> we have these like super compact cardinals, but of course we don't need full super compactness. So in the first theorem, we need only like certainly no more than lambda plus super compactness. So actually, in particular, that also lowers the large cardinal hypothesis that Omer used for his original result where to get the mutual stationarity of the elephants, he starts with omega many super compact. We only need three. And actually, if you don't need to violate SCH, you only need two. All right, uh, so next I'm going to be uh, somehow take a step back and go back again to, so because there's some nonsense theories here, do a very brief survey of comparison of regular versus singular cardinals. And again, to highlight why do we care about this analog for singular stationarity for singular cardinals? Okay. And also, uh, simultaneously, I want to give like a brief introduction of how you increase the power set of 
regular versus singular cardinals. And why do we need that? So in the first theorem, I am talking about a generic extension where SCH fails at alpha omega. So note that in order to violate SCH, what do you need to do? You need to have a singular cardinal kappa and somehow blow up its power set. Okay. So the next few slides are uh, give some background information about that. So well, this is going way back. Uh, the old theorem of Cohen that we can force the failure of CH using the Cohen faucet add omega lambda. And so this is the faucet to add lambda many reals. And note that lambda can be arbitrarily high. So then Easton came and generalized Cohen's result showing that the behavior of the power set function if we restrict it for regular cardinals, any reasonable you know, set behavior is consistent with ZFC. So what do I mean by reasonable? I mean that the only, so it has to be weakly increasing, of course, and the only constraint is Koenig's lemma, that uh, two to the kappa has to have cofinality bigger than kappa. So what about singular cardinals? Well, so let me start with the parallel of CH or GCH for singular cardinals. If kappa is singular strong limit, then two to the kappa is kappa plus. So this is uh, the singular cardinal hypothesis. And it turns out that although one can violate SCH, there are much deeper ZFC constraints to how the power set function behaves when you have uh, a, the power set function of a singular cardinal. So just to give like a little bit of a laundry list of uh, some of the more famous ones. Uh, so for example, SCH holds above a strongly compact cardinal, due to Solovey. We have Silver's theorem, which is states that you can violate SCH, but you cannot violate SCH for the first time at uncountable cofinality. So somehow there is this reflection if something happens high up at a singular cardinal of uncountable cofinality that gives a ZFC constraint of what has to happen of the power set of singulars at countable cofinality below it. This is Silver's theorem. Another, probably the, one of the most famous example of a ZFC constraint for singular combinatorics is Shalas bound that if alpha omega is strong limit, then two to the alpha omega is strictly less than alpha omega four. Oh, I should say my colleague shall ask bound, <laughs> my new colleague shall. Uh, and uh, so complementary to this, one can force fail the failure of SCH, but uh, you need large cardinals to do it. Okay. All right, so speaking of forcing the failure of SCH, okay, so how do we just in general use forcing to add many subsets of a cardinal kappa, any cardinal? So the easy case when kappa is regular, one can uh, generalize the definition of the current faucet to add lambda many subsets of kappa. Uh, so, I mean, uh, so I include these slides because I also that there will be some master students. Let's see. If not, there is a nice, um, just a recall. <laughs> uh, was there a question? So uh, conditions are partial functions from lambda cross uh, kappa to zero one with size less than kappa and you order them by reverse inclusion. And when you take a generic filter, you take the union of it, you can read lambda many new subsets of kappa. Okay. Okay, so this forcing preserves cardinals. Um, now, so which is very important, and this preservation of cardinals uses that you started with a regular cardinal kappa. What happens when kappa is singular? Well, you can try to define the above faucet, but it's not going to work because it will collapse cardinals. And therefore, a different approach is needed. And the basic strategy is the following. So since we know how to add subsets of regular cardinals, start with the regular cardinal. Use the common faucet to add many subsets of it. And then use another forcing faucet to turn your regular into a singular, i.e., to singularize uh, your cap. And this uh, singularizing is done with something called triply forcing, which is the type of forcing that changes cofinality of a regular cardinal without collapsing cardinals. 
and prick reinforcing is the one that requires large cardinals. All right, so yeah, this is the strategy, like in a nutshell, of adding subsets of singulars, uh, the subset of a large cardinal, then singularize it. And so here is a very, you know, what's the application? One very easy way to violate SCH. So let kappa be a label in the label indestructible supercompact cardinal. Force with the current pulsar to add kappa double plus many subsets of kappa. So this forcing is kappa directed plus. And therefore, after you force to add kappa uh, double plus subsets of kappa, kappa is still a large cardinal. So in particular, it's still measurable. And therefore, one can force with trick reforcing to make kappa have cofinality omega. And what do we get in the final model? So cardinals are preserved. Uh, kappa remains strong limit because it's a feature of prick reforcing that it won't add bounded subsets of kappa. And since uh, before the prick one added kappa double plus many subsets of kappa, again, two to the kappa is kappa double plus. In other words, STH fails at kappa. So this is one example of how to get a model where STH fails. Um, now, the large cardinal hypothesis, as I'll mention in a little bit, is a little bit of overkill. Um, okay, so, but this is SCH failing at just some cardinal kappa high up. Now, what about at alpha omega? Now, historically, the first result there was due to uh, Magidor in the 70s, who showed that starting with the super compact cardinal, one can force the failure at SCH at alpha omega. And he used a similar strategy as the one from the previous slide, except that in the second step, when you singularize your kappa, you have to also add interleaf collapses to collapse. So if this is your kappa, you collapse some cardinals below kappa and turn kappa into alpha omega. So in particular, he used the precretype forcing, something called the super compact precretype forcing. And uh, later, so as I mentioned, the uh, large cardinal hypothesis is a little bit of overkill by uh, works of Gittig, Mitchell, and Woodin. Uh, the hypothesis was optimally reduced to me measurable kappa of Mitchell order kappa double plus. Okay. Okay, so now since I'm gonna be talking about the a little bit about the prick reinforcing that Will and I used in our theorem. Uh, I included a slide on just the classical vanilla prickery, which is the one from two slides ago, just the prickery forcing to singularize a measurable cardinal. So uh, we want to describe a faucet P, uh, which uses a normal measure on kappa to add an omega sequence through kappa. Okay, so start with a measurable cardinal and let U be a normal measure on kappa. Now, the um, what are the forcing conditions? So the forcing conditions are pairs S comma A, where S is a finite, in, you should say increasing sequence of ordinals in kappa, and A is a measure one set. Uh, what is the ordering? So S1, A1 is stronger than S0, A0. If, well, as one might guess, S1 and extends S0. So in other words, S0 is an initial segment of S1. Now the new points, the points in S1, uh, but not in S0, are taken from A0, uh, the measure one set, and A1 is a subset of A0. So you shrink the measure one set. In other words, given, uh, just to, for people who are not too familiar with this, but know some forcing, you can think of a trick reforcing. So you wanna add an omega sequence through kappa. And as often is the case, every condition gives you some like approximation, some finite information of what the future generic omega sequence will be. So the first coordinate, the stem S, is gives you a finite initial segment of the future uh, generic omega sequence through kappa. And the measure one set A is a constraint. It tells you the possible ways you're allowed to extend S. So to extend S, you can only pick new points from the measure one set S. And this is necessary in order to prove that uh, cardinals are preserved in this forcing. If one just 
defines this without the measure one set A cardinals will be collapsed. Okay, so now let G be generic for this poset. What do you do to get your uh, for final sequence through kappa? Well, you take the union of the first coordinates of generic conditions, so union of those steps. And um, one can show by density that this is a cofinal sequence in kappa. And this sequence is called the precre sequence. So let me call it uh, kappa n, n less than omega. So this is the union of the s. This cofinal in kappa, it has order type exactly omega because any initial segment is captured by a condition. So any initial segment has to be finite. Yeah. All right. Uh, and um, okay. Um, and the precre sequence has uh, this very important property, and this follows from density, that every for every measure one set A in U, you have that for all large n, kappa n is in A. So why is that? It's because, I mean, if you take the set of conditions whose second coordinate is a subset of A, this is dense. Okay. So, another, uh, but a uh, Another thing that's very interesting about this pre forcing is that this condition uh, is not only uh, necessary, it's also sufficient for genericity. So if you have a sequence meeting on the tail end every measure one set, this sequence is actually a generic sequence for a pre forcing. And I didn't write it here, but it takes an argument one can show that this forcing preserves cardinals and doesn't add bounded subsets of kappa. But now again, uh, looking at the this crucial property of the precre sequence, and we'll be using this later, that it uh, meets every measure one set on the tail end. As a corollary, you have that the properties of those kappa ends somehow reflect the properties of kappa. So let me give you one example. Well, for example, for all our gen kappa n, kappa n is inaccessible. Well, why is that? Because there is measure one many, uh, there is a measure one set consisting only of inaccessibles. Therefore, for all our gen, kappa n is inaccessible. If you start with, and this is why I said et cetera here, if you start with kappa stronger than uh, measurable, let's say uh, uh, kappa plus super compact, et cetera, you can have even more uh, of these uh, large cardinal properties of kappa to be reflected at kappa n. And this will is something that we crucially use later. So I guess if you haven't seen precre forcing before, the thing to get from this slide is it has an omega sequence kappa n through kappa, such that the nice large cardinal properties of kappa in V are in some sense reflected to those kappa n's. <coughs> uh, any questions? Let me pause for a, for a sip of water. <clears throat> okay. All right. So this is this is the pre pre forcing. <clears throat> okay. So now, what kind of construction do we use in our theorem? So let me uh, state it again. We start with three super compact cardinals, and then there is a generic extension such that, and I should say, for every m <laughs> between zero and omega, one can. Uh, Mutual stationarity holds that the alpha ends restricted to half omega m, and ACH fails at alpha omega. Okay. So now, what is the idea? Well, there are two jobs. Well, actually, three jobs we need to do. Uh, we need to singularize a cardinal, turn it into alpha uh, omega, and somehow, you know, prove mutual stationarity. So. How do we prepare our ground model? So we start with these cardinals, kappa less than u less than lambda. Before we force with any pre pre forcing, um, we use Levy uh, collapses and Cohen posits to turn mu into kappa plus, lambda into mu plus, meaning lambda will become kappa double plus, and uh, blow up the power side of kappa while kappa is still regular to become lambda. So in particular, uh, our kappa is destined to become alpha omega, mu is destined to become alpha omega plus one, and lambda alpha omega plus two. And then once we do this preparation, 
we force um, and we do it in a way to keep the this uh, the large the super compactness of cap. Okay. Uh, so then we force with free free forcing, but now it's not enough to just singularize kappa. We want to turn it into alpha omega. So we do pre pre forcing with something called interleaved collapses. And instead of defining the forcing, I'm just going to tell you what the generic object will add. So just as in the previous slide of the vanilla forcing, we are adding a pre pre sequence kappa n and less than omega two kappa. But also we are adding a generic collapses uh, between the pre pre points. So for every uh, for every n uh, interleaved in the pre pre forcing are conditions in the Levy collapse called kappa n double plus less than kappa n minus one for n less than omega. Um, now, why kappa n double plus? Well, because we remember in the uh, ground model preparation. We made two to the kappa to be lambda and lambda to be kappa double plus. So two to the kappa is kappa double plus. And somehow that gap between kappa and two to the kappa must be reflected below kappa in order for the structure to hold up. This is why uh, we need kappa and double plus here. Okay. So what happens now in the generic extension? Well, kappa becomes alpha omega. Um, Two to the kappa is, you know, it remains being lambda, which now becomes alpha omega plus two. So we have that SCH fail at kappa now, and also kappa is strong limit. Now, why is kappa strong limit? So unlike the vanilla pre pre forcing, of course, now has to add bounded subsets of kappa. In particular, we're adding generics for this collapses below kappa, but it adds them in a nice enough way. So it doesn't, you know, kappa is still strong limit. Uh, why, uh, why is kappa preserved? Kappa is preserved because of something called the Prickery property. And what is the chain condition of this forcing? By being careful with the constraining function, uh, in our, we use something, I didn't write it on the slide. We use something called guiding generics. So the chain condition of this forcing is uh, kappa plus. So cardinals above kappa are preserved. And now why does kappa become alpha omega? So now that we're collapsing cardinals between uh, any two prickly points. So the cardinals that remain are the prickly points. They're first successors and double successors. So these are exactly uh, order type omega, many cardinals that we're preserving. And again, I didn't write it on the slide, but the very first prickly point kappa zero, uh, we force we call let's say omega one less than kappa zero. So the first kappa zero can become omega two. So any questions about the, this slide? Yeah, just the moral of the story is, I mean, you kind of do what, you know, it's just the pre pre forcing with interleaf collapses. It's actually a, 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 a standard, uh, uh, method of uh, making kappa equal alpha omega and um, in a way that um, cardinals are preserved. Okay. So we get SCH to fail at kappa. So this is job one you know, and job two. So now the next job is to show that mutual stationarity holds at the elephant. Are there questions? Okay, so how do we prove mutual stationarity at the elephant? Uh, so first then let me make a note. This takes an argument, but actually it's an ad hoc theorem to show mutual stationarity at the elephants. It's enough to show it on a tail end. <coughs> Somehow this uh, requirement for any algebra finding an elementary substructure, which meets the essence, you can always do it for any finitely many stationary sets. So the hard part of mutually stationarity is to show it when you have an infinite sequence. So it's just enough to show it on the tail end. Okay. All right. So let's uh, recall what was the definition of mutual stationarity. Like what exactly do we have to show? 
Well, we have to show that whenever we have an algebra on alpha omega and some a sequence of stationary sets S n, such that S n is a subset of this guy alpha n intersection of alpha n. Um, we have to find this elementary substructure of A meeting the S n somehow uh, for every n or for every large n. And how do we build this? Well, the rough idea is to build, uh, and this idea goes back to uh, uh, Omer's original uh, result, goes back, um, the rough idea is to build elementary substructures, m n n less than omega of A, such that sub m n intersection alpha n uh, is in S n. So know that for any n, we can always find such an elementary substructure by our you know, I think slide, slide one, uh, just because Sn is stationary. So for any algebra A, one can find an elementary substructure M with this property that its supremum intersection with alpha N is in Sn. But now we want to do it somehow simultaneously so that it works for all N. And in order to do that, we would like each Mn to index, uh, sorry, Mn plus one to end extend Mn above alpha N. In other words, once you have found your elementary substructure Mn, whose supremum intersection alpha n is in Sn, next, when you go to find your elementary substructure Mn plus one to do the same for Sn plus one, you don't want to ruin the good work you did. And in order not to ruin it, you want Mn plus one to M and extend Mn. This, uh, so what does that mean, i.e., Mn plus one intersection alpha n to equal Mn. And then the nice property you achieved here in item one will still hold for m n plus one now and Sn. So you do this in you know, omega many times, and then you take the union. And this is your this will be your elementary substructure witnessing mutual stationarity. So then the next question is: well, how does one build those those end extensions? So now that uh, in order for this inductive uh, construction to to go through, one needs a fair theorem of the form. Suppose you're given A and you're given Mn with property one, then you you can find an end extension Mn plus one, which will meet Sn plus one. And uh, it turns out that this uh, end extension can be built with um, using a certain property concerning the existence of certain ideals, which I'm going to talk about uh, in the next slide. Yeah. And the uh, idea of using ideals to give this, uh, to build this M and, uh, and extensions, that's due to uh, Benaria. Uh, so next uh, slide will somehow uh, formalize that. Okay, so let me fix uh, now. I'm going to think about the final model in our theorem. So we started with this super compact kappa. We did some preparation making kappa plus and kappa double plus be uh, the former super compact, blowing up the power set of kappa, and did pre forcing of kappa to singularize it and turn it into alpha. And now we want to prove mutual stationarity. Now we pick some k, and we uh, want to talk about mutual stationarity for sets restricted to cough uh, alpha n. So first, alpha n, this is just some cardinal force below kappa. So let nu less than kappa be forced by some precondition to be uh, alpha n. And we're gonna work below this, uh, this precondition. So working below this precondition, now we have to show mutual stationarity at the alpha n's intersection of new for uh, you know all our gems so on the tail end of n less than omega. Okay. So now the next definition, which uh, we call daggers of theta, actually captures this idea from um, Benaria's paper of how one can use ideals to build end extensions, uh, models that are end extensions. So we say that daggers of theta holds for an uncountable cardinal theta if the following happens. So 
for every stationary subset in theta, there is a non-stationary theta complete uh, new plus one closed ideal for which S is a positive set. So this is the, the property daggers of theta. Okay. And uh, the next fact uh, um, uh, says the, uh, is that using these daggers, dagger properties, we can build our end uh, expansion and I can summarize it in the, the following statement. So suppose in the final model for all our chain, daggers of Aleph and Holt. And for uh, some technical reasons, we also need that all stationary subsets of Aleph and are approachable. So the approachability property holds. Then mutual stationarity holds for the Aleph and restricted to this cough new. And the proof is you know, basically what I said in the previous slide. Uh, given a stationary sequence Sn in the elephants with that co-finality and some algebra A on kappa. Using dagger, dagger allows you to inductively build this sequence of elementary uh, substructures of A, which are end extensions, M and N less than omega, so that for every N, sub Mn intersection elephant is in Sn. And their end extensions, meaning M n plus one intersection alpha n equals M n. And then you take the union. And this is very roughly how uh, you prove elementary uh, mutual stationarity. Okay. So just to sum up, now we've reduced the problem that in our final model, we have to show that this uh, property dagger holds. So we have to show that for every uh, cardinal below kappa, uh, theta, dagger, daggers of theta hold. And I said for every, but I meant uh, module or some finite initial segment. And so just to give a credit where credit is due, the idea uh, of using these ideals to build those elementary substructures that are end extensions, this is due to honor. But now what remains for us to do is to show that in this uh, pre extension, we do have daggers. Okay. All right. So next slide is, well, how does one go about proving uh, daggers? So proving that uh, cardinals have this ideal. So now that what are we trying to prove? That for every stationary set, you can have some ideal for which S is um, a complete ideal for which S is positive. A complete uh, close enough ideal for which I think. And uh, this is done using uh, listed elementary embeddings, which has to correspond to nice enough quotients. So let me describe kind of like the basic idea. So suppose we have, uh, so this is just like an ad hoc. You have some model B, and uh, suppose you have some faucet Q and a generic G for Q. And suppose in D you had some elementary embedding J, uh, which you are able to lift over BG. So we have J is an elementary embedding from BG to some M with critical point theta such that uh, the quotient J of Q mod G is new plus one closed. So remember, new here is this some fixed cardinal which uh, is forced to be our fixed cofinality. And uh, Q is two to the theta CC. So here I mean Q to two to the theta as computed in D. I should have used a, another cardinal tau, but I got lazy. So Q is two to the theta CC. And M is closed under that those sequences of lengths two to the theta, again, as, as computed in D. Okay. And now let S be a stationary subset of BG. Okay. So, this uh, next statement tells you exactly how to get those ideals. Well, the statement is, is, is that then one can find gamma in, oh, sorry, this is a typo. So this should be theta. So gamma in J of theta set, my, uh, set minus theta. So if this is theta, of course, J of theta is moved. So gamma is somewhere in between. 
and some condition Q in the quotient, which is our first you forced with this quotient to leave the embedding in the quotient, such that if you take the following ideal, let I be the ideal of all subsets uh, in VG, so they're represented by some A dot G, such that Q forces gamma is not in J of A dot. So these are subsets of theta. Uh, and you can find this gamma in Q such that this idea witnesses daggers of theta for that. So let me. Uh, Um, let me tell you a little bit why, uh, I mean, I didn't write it on the slide, but why, uh, why this is uh, the desired ideal. So, um, okay. so first, know that for any gamma and any Q, I mean, forget about S for a second. So just if you take this definition, some gamma in J of theta minus uh, theta and some Q in the forcing. We define this ideal. Um, this ideal will be uh, will be a complete uh, enclosed idea. Why? Because um, because the quotient is closed, and uh, this takes an argument. And I think originally this uh, we proved it in our paper because I couldn't find it in the literature, but I think it's somewhere in um, Matt's uh, handbook chapter. Okay. So we're taking here subsets of theta and now that is since a dot here will be q name j of a dot is a uh, j of q name so it's natural to ask whether q forces this gamma in j of a dot yeah now how do we choose uh, gamma and q to be so that s is positive for this ideal well so you have to do some bookkeeping you enumerate um so first you enumerate all the club subsets of theta in VG, then you take J image dot, those club subsets and you intersect it. So here we use that M is closed under two to the theta sequences. So M can see all the J image of the club subsets of theta. And by the, um, since J of theta is bigger than theta, you can intersect those club subsets and you can find some gamma uh, which is in this intersection together with J of S. And uh, this is how you pick your gamma. So somehow the proof is straightforward. This is why I didn't want to uh, uh, write it on the, um, on the slide. Okay, any questions about this? This is probably one of the most somehow technical slides. So uh, yeah, maybe just like to to be sure, is this is this where you use uh, super compactness of uh, of the second cardinal? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this is exactly the the next little bit here. I mean, how do we get this lifted elementary embedding? So now that we do need M to be closed. Basically. Okay. Thanks. So we need this. Well, maybe not need, but we probably need uh, this data to have been a super compact cardinal in some inner model. How super compact? Well, at least two to the theta super compact. And in uh, what inner model? Well, an inner model by a nice enough forcing. So, you know, Q cannot be any forcing. It has to be, so it has to be liftable forcing and uh, with good enough chain condition forcing. Okay. All right. Okay. So we need to have this uh, dagger, which uh, is given by these lifted elementary embeddings, which are given by uh, super compactness in a previous life. Okay. So now, uh, having said that, let me summarize how now one will get dagger in our prickly uh, model below kappa. Okay. So again, recall we have a former super compact kernel kappa, which now became alpha omega. And we have a pre sequence kappa and, and less than omega. And now uh, what cardinals did we keep uh, preserved below kappa? So recall we forced to collapse all cardinals between um, kappa and double plus and kappa n plus one. So in particular, the only cardinals for which we need to prove dagger, the only cardinals to worry about are now the pre points, the kappa n's, their successors, kappa n plus, and double successors, kappa and double plus. 
And here, when I say successors, this is both as computed in the uh, well, in the ground model for the precreate and in the extension for the precreate. Okay, so how so we have to prove the dagger hold for all of these guys. Okay, so why does dagger hold for the cap x? Well, so first we have that. So when I say the ground model here, I mean the prepared ground model, also the, the original model, but the prepared ground model for the precreate by indestructibility, cap is super compact in the ground model over which we force with the precreate. And we use this super compactness to get dagger at kappa. Now, by a further argument, you can actually get dagger at kappa not only in B, but in an ultra power. And then we combine this dagger at kappa with uh, something I said a, a few slides ago that remember the free free points that in the same, uh, in a sense, reflect the properties of kappa. And here one shows that this reflection is strong enough that actually dagger at kappa gives you, uh, oh, I didn't write it here, gives you dagger at the kappa ends. So we have that this dagger at kappa uh, in the ground model gives you that dagger holds at the kappa ends. Okay. Now, what about the kappa, the successors, kappa s plus? Well, if the kappa ends reflect you know, the properties of kappa, again, using the fact that kappa is, uh, you know, more than measurable. So it's, I, I think kappa has to be like lambda plus super compact. What properties do the successors kappa and plus reflect? Well, um, they reflect the properties of kappa plus and kappa plus was uh, super compact in a prior life. So kappa plus is mu, where mu was super compact in the beginning. So using that mu was super compact in the beginning, we get the daggers of mu holds now in the ground model where mu is no longer super compact, but the forcing to prepare the ground model is nice and liftable. So the forcing we used to prepare the ground model was, you know, like two Levy collapses and a cone, you know, to make mu kappa plus, lambda kappa double plus, and blow up two to the cap. So this is a nice liftable forcing any way you slice it. Okay. So then one can uh, use the former liftable <laughs> super compactness of mu to get that dagger holds at mu in the ground model. And this reflects, uh, and you get the dagger holds at the kappa n plus. Okay. Now, what about the kappa n double plus? Well, who do they reflect? I mean, they reflect the properties of kappa double plus. And what is kappa double plus? Well, this was lambda, which also was uh, super compact in the beginning. So again, we use the fact that lambda was formerly super compact to get uh, dagger at kappa double plus, and then use uh, nice reflection properties of the pre sequence to get dagger in kappa and double plus. Now here for all of these three, when I say dagger at kappa n or dagger at kappa n plus or dagger at kappa n double plus, I mean, as stated in the ground model B. Of course, the ground model doesn't have the full sequence of the kappa n's, but each individual kappa n is in the ground model. So we're not done yet. So this is only somehow to get the dagger n at the kappa n plus and double plus in this only the first part. The next uh, kind of uh, part of the argument that we had to do is to show that the uh, prequel forcing preserves this dagger, preserves the existence of those ideas. And usually this is done by somehow breaking up the prequel forcing into uh, a small part or at least a chain condition part, depending on which cardinal you talk about. And uh, a quotient, of course, it cannot be closed, but a distributed quotient. Um, and, uh, you know, it takes an argument, but one can show that for each of these three cases, going uh, part by part in this breakage of the pre reinforcing, the existence of the property saying, oh, those ideals exist is, is preserved. And uh, I just want to mention that somehow the <laughs> The hardest case is kappa double plus, but you cannot get away from this case 
because one of the key points is to make two to the kappa be kappa double plus. So one has to preserve kappa and double plus. Yeah. So I have a couple more slides. And remember, I had two theorems. And as I correctly guessed, I only will have time to present in detail the first one. Uh, so, so this is it for the mutual stationarity and failure of LTH at all of omega. Now, let me say something. I'm just going to take two minutes because we started a little late, if that's okay. About uh, so the second theorem we have was so there's a different construction uh, about obtaining mutual stationarity together with the true property at all of omega plus one. So let me just tell you, uh, so recall what the true property states. So at some cardinal kappa, no, kappa is a, a, a new cardinal here. Uh, the tree property at kappa holds if, oh, this should be not is, but if, if every tree of height kappa and levels of size less than kappa has a cofinal branch. So some laundry uh, list of facts, uh, some facts of life about the tree property. Well, it's a higher analog of, you can think of it as a higher analog of Koenig's infinity levels. So the tree property holds at omega, for example, and the infinite finitely branching tree has an infinite branch. Now, what about at omega one? Well, there it fails, namely, uh, there is an arrangement tree. Um, now, where can it hold above omega? Well, it holds at weakly compact cardinals. And actually it's used uh, in uh, sometimes as the definition of a weakly compact cardinal as being inaccessible plus the tree property. Okay, so what about all of two? Well, uh, it can be forced to hold the tau of two. This is the famous uh, result due to Mitchell, and it can be forced from a weakly compact cardinal. So you start with a weakly compact and do some nice forcing to turn that weakly compact into L of two, where the three properties still holds. Now, what about successor of singulars? Because here we're talking about successor of singulars. Well, if you have a limit of super compact cardinals, it will hold at the successor of their limit. And using that, it can be forced to hold at L of omega plus one from omega many super compact cardinals. And I guess for us, this last line is somehow the whole, the most relevant. Okay. And I, I just have one, one more slide. So uh, recalling Ben Neri's model, uh, since he just does Levy collapses, the tree property fails. Uh, but it turns out that the two properties are orthogonal, which is what we show in like the second theorem that from omega many super compact cardinals, one can get a generic extension where mutual stationarity holds at the elephants with some fixed uncountable cofinality, and the three property holds at L of omega plus one. And some of the, so the construction here boils down to picking uh the cardinal who is going to become omega one in a very special way in order to ensure that the tree property holds at l of omega plus one okay and let me just say i'm not going to say anything about the, the proof of this theorem just about the result that uh it parallels the fact that say at the double successor of a cardinal regular or sing singular the tree property and stationary reflection are orthogonal so somehow mutual stationarity has the same flavor as in spirit of stationary reflection. Okay. And, it, and it's orthogonal to the tree property, just like stationary reflection is at the double success. Okay. Uh, and I have a couple of two open questions in case there are ambitious uh, grad students or postdocs or, or faculty in the audience. Uh, so, this is kind of an old, uh, old problem. So now that here I said, we know that the tree property and stationary reflection are orthogonal at the double successor of a cardinal. Uh, well, can we get uh, mutual stationarity together with failure of STH and stationary reflection at L of omega plus one? So all three properties together. Uh, another, and this is kind of a general open-ended open question, well, what about uncountable cofinality? 
can we uh, make these results for uncountable cofinalities? And of course, if one were to try to do this, instead of strictly forcing, you would have to use Magidor forcing. So the arguments for that dagger preservation now will be more complicated. And uh, yeah, and this is it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. So are there any questions? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, also for the second TM, you get uh, that for all M simultaneously, or for each M you have to change the construction? Um, it's actually simultane simultaneously, you don't okay, so it's... Yeah, and, and I, again, I should have written the M. And do I get it right that when you use your uh, lifting theorem, you use forcings that have size bigger than the critical point? So this G is generic for a forcing of size bigger than theta. Um, yes. Okay. So it's more complicated than this case. Um, yes, but still, just like when... Um, so in both theorems, I mean, somehow the embeddings that you lift over are combinations of Levy collapses and common posets. So, I mean, of course, you never lift it over the uh, the prequel. And uh, here you, um, so in, in a way, the construction of the second theorem is somehow uh, more straightforward because you don't need to violate ACH. It's just Levy collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the other theorem, of course, you do not lift it over the precree, but over only some uh, of the collapsing generics that are interlinked in the precree. Mm -hmm. And I guess the the more hard part is uh, the part when when you have this preservation of the of the not to establish it in this. Uh, Pieces, but then to show that when you collapse to alpha omega, you preserve this stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, so it's somehow easy enough to get this property I call dagger at kappa kappa plus kappa double plus. But uh, the two hard part is first to get it at the kappa n plus and double plus, and also within the pre forcing. So one has to analyze exactly what are the new stationary sets, which part of the prickly forcing may add a stationary set or destroy an idea, et cetera. But this is why I, um, so although the, the idea of using uh, ideals, I mean, th this is due to Omer, um, for us, it was very useful to, uh, so the, if people who know me know the word dagger is <laughs> something that uh, I, I like to label things. It was very useful for us to uh, formulate this property that could be treated both as global and as a local property dagger in order to- Sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't hear what you said. It was very useful for us to formulate this ideal existence in this kind of property dagger that we can treat both as global and as local in order to prove theorems about how dagger reflects that. Okay. So at some point we apply Loesch's theorem to it, etc. But yeah, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was just asking if there were other questions. And maybe I have one, but so I, I don't really want to go into details. But so um, I mean, you you said that. And the geometric condition gives you reflection um, co-boundedly on the previous sequence. And here you're reflecting on all the elements of the previous sequence, right, to your property. So is this, I don't know, typical of this dagger? I mean, are you using the geometric condition or is some kind of different argument? Um, I, I you do you not do need to uh, prove it for all n, you do not need to prove it for all large n. Because mutual stationarity, if you prove it on a tail end, it follows for 
uh, at all. Ah, okay. Okay. But, but also to answer your question, you can always force below a measure one set, and if something is true for all Rgen, you can assume that it's true for all. Okay. I mean, uh, above the fixed cofinality. But okay. here you, you can have to prove it for all our gen. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions from the people at home? No? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.